As an introduction into the skeletal system of vertebrates, obviously there'll be discussion of the skull bones and the arm bones and the changes in shape for changes in locomotion, etc. However, I'd like to begin with the different types of tissue in the skeletal system, which then obviously brings us to cartilage. No, a bone uh, outweighs cartilage in uh, the human body. Here's uh, cartilage where we see um, that there are uh, cells within the cartilage matrix. Um, but cartilage was the original skeletal material before there was bone or the components of teeth like enamel and dentin, there was uh, cartilage. So cartilage is what is called a connective tissue. There are three parts of a connective tissue. There are specialized cells, and these will then have names, as we'll see. Uh, they can be called chondroblasts if they are immature cells in cartilage or chondrocytes or mature cells. Then there is a, an extracellular protein fiber known as collagen here. Collagen uh, can represent you know, up to say 40% of cartilage and maybe 25% of bone. Um, and then there uh, was a gel-like matrix called chondroitin sulfate. Those three things make cartilage. Interestingly, even though it was the first tissue in the vertebrate skeletal system, it is known in some invertebrates as well. Um, it can uh, be uh, in a, a sensory uh, structure or a proboscis, say in uh, brachiopods or uh, annelids. Um, it can, uh, so here's a brachiopod, and it can have a bit of a cartilage um, uh, supporting uh, the uh, lophophore. Um, uh, it can uh, be found uh, in uh, the head uh, region and under the brain of horseshoe crabs. Uh, it can be found uh, in uh, mollusks. And so cartilage is an old tissue predating uh, vertebrates. In the vertebrate uh, uh, lineage closer to it, the deuterostomes uh, begin with uh, hemichordates, such as the acorn worm still alive uh, today, and they can have cartilage in their uh, proboscis. Now, uh, obviously, we have to say what we mean by cartilage. It is not exactly like uh, the, uh, oh, and I'm sorry, uh, and then uh, as we will see with the uh, lancelets. There can even be uh, cartilage-like uh, tissue uh, supporting uh, the pharyngeal uh, slits of uh, the acorn worms. Um, now, uh, what do we mean uh, by uh, cartilage? Uh, well, if you're going to compare things, you can compare the collagen uh, genes. Uh, you can compare the structure to see if cells are there or not. You can ask what genes cause the cartilage to be formed. Um, and there certainly are similarities. Now, they're not precise. So for example, the invertebrates lack cellular cartilage. There are no cells inside, um, but nevertheless, it expresses many of uh, the uh, same uh, genes. By the time you get to the cephalochordates, which are true chordates like lancelets, um, their cartilage is more similar to the cartilage of uh, vertebrates than uh, was the cartilage of say mollusks and arthropods. So uh, cartilage became more similar to the cartilage used in vertebrates over time, having a homologous uh, tissue originating uh, in ancestral organisms, um, uh, which are the common answers, ancestor of mollusks, annelids, brachiopods, um, and uh, uh, the vertebrates. Um, but as we get closer to the vertebrate ancestry, the cartilage gets more similar. And once again, if this is the gill slits of a lancelet, they really do use these slits uh, as gills, unlike the hemichordates where they are just involved in feeding. There is cartilage uh, in the gill slits, just as there is um, uh, in uh, uh, in uh, the vertebrates. Uh, by the time we get to the very first vertebrate, so if this is a lancelet, a cephalochordate, and this is the larva of a lamprey, a vertebrate, um, now there is more cartilage uh, still. So the jawless uh, fish, um, they um, these include the uh, hagfish and lampreys alive uh, today, but also include the very first fish of the Cambrian period, you know, more than 500 million years ago, like Milocudmingia and Hycoichthys. Uh, these 
um, uh, fossils had uh, had a cartilage in them. And this cartilage is uh, made by cells called neural crest cells. This is something that only vertebrates have. So vertebrates will make bigger skeletons and more skeletons with arm and leg bones and you know the, the bones can form in multiple places. But the very first vertebrates formed um, the uh, skeletal uh, tissues uh, from neural crest cells and primarily in the head. They are called neural crest cells because as the neural tube uh, forms. Uh, it forms these two folds and along the crest there are these little cells here in green uh, which will not form part of the tube uh, but they will make a number of important um, uh, structures. Uh, and so um, uh, cartilage in uh, vertebrates uh, originates uh, uh, there. Now uh, in lampreys uh, the cartilage skeleton is a bit more uh, elaborate. Both of the jawless fish actually put a little cartilage under the brain um, and around the ear, forming an otic capsule. And so uh, the jawless fish seem to be, you know, forming a skull made of these endoskeletal uh, uh, tissues. Um, and nowhere near as extensive as later fish, but nevertheless the beginnings. Um, but vertebrae will then also I'm sorry, my fault, lampreys will then also form uh, the very first vertebrae. Now that little piece there, that doesn't look impressive, that doesn't look impressive, but it's a little piece of cartilage uh, running along the uh, notochord. This is how vertebrae begin. Uh, so once again, the jawless fish do not have skulls or vertebral columns the way that later fish will, um, but they have the beginnings of them and uh, cartilage is uh, the skeletal tissue used in these uh, structures. Here you can see cartilage in the tail fin of, uh, of a hagfish. Uh, and so as uh, we'll see when we talk later about uh, the skull, the vertebrate skull has three main components, uh, which uh, forms uh, at different times in history. The first part of the skull is what's known as the gill arch skeleton, starting with the cartilage around the gills. Um, this, that's known as the splanchnocranium. Uh, then a part known as the condocranium uh, will start as cartilage under uh, the brain, around the eye, around the ear, uh, that then uh, gets bigger and will gradually encase the brain. So here, as we will see later, this is a shark's head, all made of cartilage. And here you can see there's cartilage around uh, the gills, that's known as the splanchnocranium. And here you can see cartilage of uh, the jaws and completely encasing uh, the brain. This is known as the condocranium. So uh, cartilage uh, is the first ver uh, skeletal tissue that even predates the vertebrates. And it uh, is the original uh, skeletal tissue in uh, the vertebrates. And so uh, once again, the fascinating thing is if you're trying to uh, find where in the family tree that it originated, um, it had to have come prior to the separation of the um, protostomes uh, like uh, mollusks, arthropods, brachiopods, and annelids from the deuterostomes like the, the cephalochordates, the hemichordates, and the vertebrates. And so certainly by uh, this point in the uh, family uh, tree, cartilage must have existed for the same genes to be used um, in those uh, different branches. Now I mentioned collagen as a component of uh, uh, of cartilage. Um, and so just uh, let me uh, back up and say a few things about uh, cartilage. Uh, I'm sorry, about collagen. So a connective tissue, once again, has specialized cells. It has proteins outside the cells. All pro cells have proteins inside, but some cells make proteins which are extracellular, which will then lie outside the uh, cells. So here you can see the, the wide uh, light red fibers, that's collagen, as opposed to these other fibers, such as uh, elastic fibers and um, reticular fibers. Uh, and so you see a lot of collagen here. Collagen is actually the major extracellular protein in um, all animals and certainly the vertebrates. So if you were to look at a tendon, 
Um, in a tendon, you would see the cells which make the collagen, but most of the tendon is collagen. Ligaments are primarily collagen. The white of your eye is collagen. The dermis of your skin is mostly uh, collagen. Collagen is the major extracellular protein in, uh, in, uh, in vertebrates. Uh, so here you can see the dermis of the skin and all those you know, fibers that is, um, uh, that is uh, uh, that's collagen. Um, and uh, collagen is present in cartilage and bone. Now I know that isn't what leaps to mind because it doesn't look you know, like collagen. But if you were to say, let's say we take bone and we leach out the calcium, we dissolve the calcium from bone, and we now have what's called decalcified bone. Does the structure disappear? No. So if you were to take a chicken bone and take the calcium out, you would still have something that looks like a chicken bone, except now it would bend. Because if you've taken away the calcium salts, what you're left with is the collagen. So collagen can make up a quarter of bone and even more so of uh, cartilage. Uh, so uh, it is a, uh, it was uh, the original extracellular tissue of the animals. It's the most abundant extracellular tissue of animals. And then cartilage and bone adopted it to make a large portion of their matrix. Just so you know, collagen is interesting in that it's formed by a triple helix and we have different collagen genes. And so collagen in say one tissue could have three of the same types of protein. So you use one gene, you use it three times, you make three of these alpha helices which wind around each other. Or you could use two or three different collagen genes and then make two or three different proteins and then wrap them around each other. So the collagen say of cartilage can be different from the collagen of uh, of bone. And so um, the uh, collagen, which is used for both skeleton and bone, goes back to the origin of animals and even uh, prior uh, to that. And uh, then it was uh, the invertebrates which began use, even fungi can have uh, collagen uh, in them. Um, uh, but all uh, animals, uh, this is the uh, major extracellular um, uh, protein. Uh, here you can see a sponge and you can see a lot of uh, its collagen. And here's the dermis of the human skin where you see uh, uh, collagen. Okay. So cartilage is made of collagen, of a gel of uh, proteins known as uh, proteoglycans, and then cells. So um, I know this sounds odd that both bone and cartilage are living tissues. That may sound odd because, you know, if you were ever to study bones in lab, you know, they just sit on the table and they're, they're kind of brill actually. Well, that's not really bone. And if there was cartilage there, that really wouldn't be cartilage. That's just the dead remnants of what was once a living tissue. If you look at cartilage under the microscope, there are plenty of cells. So, in cartilage, we would give these cells names. They would be called chondroblasts if they were part of immature cartilage that was, say, growing. And so here you can see cartilage on the outside uh, with these cells chondroblasts, and then even they can continue growing on the inside. If this is a mature cartilage, uh, which is no longer um, expanding, um, it, uh, then these cells would be called chondrocytes. So chondroblasts and chondrocytes are the immature cells of uh, cartilage. They make little spaces for themselves uh, uh, known as lacunae where uh, they um, can uh, inhabit. <clears throat> so there are different kinds of cartilage and I'll show you that uh, in just uh, a second. What you're seeing now is that cells within the cartilage can actually divide. So this cell divided and the two daughter cells make cartilage matrix between them and then move farther apart. This cell will divide and the two daughter cells will make um, a, a cartilage matrix uh, between them. And when you do that, that is what is known as interstitial growth, growth from within. Cartilage can grow from within. Um, it can grow interstitially, bone cannot. All right, once you have cells in the middle of bone, which are called osteoblasts, then they become osteocytes and they then, um, uh, uh, then mature, but they cannot 
uh, and then uh, divide. So both bone and cartilage will have these uh, specialized uh, cells. Uh, once again, cartilage is unlike bone in that while both bone and cartilage can grow, grow from the outside, right? So you can have um, a bone uh, growing from the outside. So you can just lay down another layer of bone salts, another layer of bone salts, and cartilage can do that as well. Um, that's what's called appositional growth. Only cartilage can grow interstitially uh, because bone is just too rigid, all right? So here you can see bone growing appositionally and cartilage can do the same, where the cells on the outside of the bone or cartilage just make more matrix and then just the, the bone or cartilage gets wider and wider. That is known as appositional growth. Um, bone can grow appositionally, cartilage can grow appositionally. Once again, it was the cells on the outside which were laying down additional layers of cartilage here. But cartilage is unlike bone in that um, uh, it can then grow interstitially as well. A couple other differences between cartilage and bone. Um, bone is vascular. Bone has room for uh, blood vessels. So each of these holes is where a blood vessel passes through the bone uh, tissue. Cartilage is unlike that. Cartilage is avascular. It lacks uh, blood vessels. There are different kinds of cartilage in uh, the vertebrate body, just to talk about uh, humans. Uh, the most uh, common uh, type is hyaline cartilage. Hyaline cartilage is what would comprise our trachea. It would be what uh, all of our bones are made of uh, uh, in our appendicular skeleton um, before uh, they uh, get converted uh, to a bone. They start off from uh, cartilage. Um, uh, we have a cartilage in a hyaline cartilage in our larynx. Here's the hyaline cartilage of the trachea, uh, where the ribs meet the sternum. That's hyaline cartilage. Where two bones rub against each other at a joint. So at the shoulder, there's cartilage over both the head of the humerus and uh, the uh, scapula, and it's hyaline cartilage. At the elbow, the humerus and the forearm bones rub together with hyaline cartilage. So hyaline cartilage is found uh, in many places of uh, the body. Elastic cartilage has more elastic fibers and is more bendable and is found in two places of the body. It's found in the external ear. You can see how flexible that is. And then uh, it is also found in the epiglottis. That's uh, something which will uh, close at, and close off the trachea when we swallow uh, so that you know, whatever food we've swallowed will not go into our airway. So the epiglottis, uh, which protects our airway from food, uh, that is also made of elastic cartilage. There is a third type of cartilage known as fiber cartilage, which can also be found in places where, say, the two pubic bones meet uh, in the knee, the two menisci, which help the, uh, the bones fit together better, are made of fiber cartilage. When we break a bone and the bone is healing, uh, then uh, the calluses are uh, made of, um, of uh, fiber cartilage. Okay. So, uh, Cartilage was the original um, a tissue of skeletal uh, systems in vertebrates. Uh, that was a few uh, thoughts on cartilage. Um, bone would come later. Now, bone is also a connective tissue. It has uh, collagen fibers, making up about a quarter of bone. There is a hard uh, extracellular uh, uh, matrix, um, which has not only the collagen, but now also calcium salts, uh, a mix of calcium uh, uh, phosphate and calcium carbonate known as hydroxyapatite. Um, and then we have cells. There are different kinds of cells present in bone. There are the stem cells, which still have the ability to divide. These are known as osteoprogenitor cells. Some of these could actually become chondroblasts and make cartilage if that's what your body needed. Um, from these osteoprogenitor cells, we can get osteoblasts. These are the immature cells which make bone. Um, osteoblasts can become osteocytes. So here you see osteoblasts making bone. And if one of them gets left behind as the matrix forms, then it will be stuck in the middle of the bone where it becomes an osteocyte. 
All right, it can't be an osteoblast if it's in the middle of the bone because osteoblasts make bone and bone is too rigid. You know, a cell in the middle can't make more bone because where would it go? So it is known as an osteocyte. And then there's one more cell type um, called an osteoclast, which dissolves bone. And so as you know, we grow mature, as we change our activity patterns, um, we can make new bone with osteoblasts. Osteoblasts make bone, um, but we could also then dissolve bone and make our skeleton smaller with osteoclasts. So once again, um, bone uh, in a living organism is a living connective tissue, and it would have specialized cells and extracellular protein uh, fibers uh, like collagen, and then also um, uh, uh, the calcium uh, uh, phosphate salts known as hydroxyapatite. Once again, bone can grow through appositional growth by laying down more bone on uh, the outside, but it cannot grow interstitially because it's too uh, rigid. There you saw it growing appositionally and note that some osteoblasts got left behind and this would be the origin of osteocytes. As the bone grows, it can grow around collagen fibers, say from nearby ligaments and tendons. And that way the, the tendon and the ligament actually goes into the bone and becomes a part of the bone tissue. So that when the, say the muscle pulls on the bone, the bone comes because you know, uh, the tendon of the muscle, it has collagen fibers, which are now actually incorporated into the bone as it grew. And um, through appositional growth, uh, uh, blood vessels can even be incorporated into a uh, growing uh, bone. Sorry about that. Uh, so uh, appositional growth, something uh, which is done uh, by both bone and cartilage, means that these cells on the outside uh, are expanding, adding new matrix from the outside. And in bone, you, they can actually grow around blood vessels. So during appositional growth, uh, osteoblasts can get left behind, become osteocytes. Collagen fibers from tendons uh, can be incorporated um, and blood vessels uh, can be incorporated as well. Um, another uh, quick distinction is when we look at bone, either you know, visually or under the microscope, um, it can look different because there are two forms of bone. There's what's called compact bone and then spongy bone. Compact bone um, is dense, as you would guess by the name, and it is made of these structures known as osteon. So here you're looking at an osteon, this circular structure here. Compact bone has osteon, a spongy bone does not. In an osteon, what you have are blood vessels. Once again, um, uh, bone is very vascular. About a liter of blood will go through your skeleton in the next three minutes or so. And so there are blood vessels here, arteries and veins, around which there are um, rings of bone salts known as lamellae. And I use the term here concentric. So here's a ring of bone salts around the blood vessels. And then there'll be another one that's a little wider, another one a little wider, another one a little wider, et cetera. So this is what is called an osteon, these concentric rings of bone um, as salt lamellae around uh, blood vessels. And uh, if you look at, you can see a number of dark spots uh, here. Those are the cells, the osteocytes. And there are these thin channels known as canaliculi, uh, which are connected, okay? So that is compact bone. Where do you find compact bone? It is on the outside of every bone. So the exterior of every bone is made of compact bone. And if you look at the shafts of long bones, like the arm and leg bones, the shaft of that was known as the diaphysis uh, is made of a compact bone, okay? So the outside of all bones and then the shaft or the diaphysis of the, um, of the long bones. Here you can see a different type of bone tissue. This is known as spongy bone. No, it's not as dense. There are no osteons. Instead, you just have those, these thin struts of lamellae. And notice that they're facing all different directions. And that's because, you know, think about your arm or your leg. Um, your legs are always transmitting force in the same direction. So the osteons, if they're all going up and down, they're transmitting force in the direction that you need. However, at the ends of the bone, what are known as the epiphyses, as you then, you know, move on your uh, hip, 
the angle at which you know uh, gravity is pulling on the weight of your body will change. So notice here, you've got these struts of bone facing in all different directions so that they can accommodate um, uh, stresses from uh, multiple uh, directions. Uh, so spongy bone, we have at the ends of the long bones in epiphyses. Um, now, what we could have here is red bone marrow uh, where blood is actually made. Although what happens as we you know, go from being you know, fetuses to infants to adults, that the uh, amount of red bone marrow we have decreases. So for example, in my arm, I still have red bone marrow in the epiphysis of my, uh, the proximal end of my humerus, um, but the distal end of my humerus has probably just fatty now instead. Uh, and so here you can see compact bone on the surface of the bone, but here you can see uh, the spongy bone uh, in a uh, side. Um, another uh, quick distinction to make is how does bone form? Well, there's actually two ways that, that bone forms. One is that you can be in the middle of, say, the dermis uh, of the skin, uh, and you have cells that say, hey, this would be a great place to make bone. So they differentiate coming from, say, mesenchymal stem cells in the fetus uh, to become uh, osteoprogenitor cells and osteoblasts. And once you have osteoblasts, then they just start making bone. So you have made the cells that make bone and they start making bone. And now all of the middle, in the middle of your skin, uh, all of a sudden in the middle of your skin, you have a piece of bone. It's known as dermal bone formed in the dermis. Um, and now it can just get bigger. You can grow from that positional growth and just make it bigger. And that's how this bone formed, the frontal bone and the parietal bone and the maxillary bone. Um, so most of my skull formed as dermal bone or through intermembranous ossification. In the middle of a membrane, like the dermis of the skin, I just decided to make bone. Also a little piece of my, part of my clavicle started that way too. So um, the skull and clavicle, most of the skull, uh, formed through this intermembranous ossification where we just start making bone. And that's important to remember that the dermis can make bone. So when, you, when we talk about turtles, turtles have a shell and part of that is dermal bone. The, the, the skin decided to make bone where the shell is. Uh, crocodiles can have um, dermal bone in their hide, making their hide extra thick. Armadillos can make dermal bone. There were armored dinosaurs which make dermal bone. Uh, so the dermis, just the, the skin can make bone. All uh, of the uh, osteichthyans have it in the skull, you know, perhaps in the clavicle as well. Um, uh, but then dermal bone uh, can then provide armor uh, in um, some other uh, uh, groups. Now, obviously our skeleton is bigger than the skull and the clavicle. And so the rest of the bone forms differently. But as an adult, it's just bone. So here I have bone in my skull, here I have bone in my arm. It's just bone. But they formed in two completely different ways. The bone of the appendicular skeleton, the arms, the legs, the shoulder girdle, uh, the hip girdle, the vertebrae, it did not form uh, through intermembranous ossification. It is not dermal bone. Instead, what happened is you started off with a cartilage model, okay? So this type of ossification is known as endochondral ossification, where cond is a prefix which means cartilage, if you're, if you're men. Remember chondroblasts, chondrocytes, these are cartilage cells. So pericon I'm sorry, so endochondral ossification, uh, there is a cartilage model. Uh, so as a fetus, I had what looked like a femur and a hip and a, you know, a humerus, but it wasn't bone, it was a cartilaginous structure. So um, uh, these appendicular uh, structures start off as cartilage first. And then you get to a point where you start to make bone in the middle of the cartilage. So even though it's like a, a humerus-like structure that's made of cartilage, now you're going to start making bone here at what's called the primary center of ossification. So that's where the bone making starts. And from here then, it will start to expand and go towards the ends. But that's a problem you don't want it to get to the ends because once this structure becomes fully bone, 
then you're done growing. It has then become as big as it ever will. So you certainly don't want as a fetus or as you know, a two-year-old infant to have you know, this primary center of ossification produce so much bone that it reaches um, the epiphyses at uh, the end because now you're done growing and you know, your femur or your humerus you know, are only an inch or two uh, long. So you certainly don't want that. So then what happens here is that other centers of ossification will form what are known as secondary centers of ossification at the ends of the bone and the epiphyses. So if the shaft is the diaphysis, here the ends of the bone, those are called the epiphyses. And so uh, now you will have secondary centers of ossification forming there. So there is now bone in the shaft coming from that primary center there is bone at the ends in the epiphyses coming from these secondary uh, centers. Um, and so now um, uh, this can keep growing, but now an extremely important region is the cartilage between the two, all right? So notice here's bone in the shaft, here's bone in the uh, epiphysis, but notice that there will be a plate of cartilage, what many people call the growth plate, or more properly called the epiphys uh, epiphyseal plate, all right? At the epiphyseal plate, we have a band of cartilage between two bone fronts. Remember that cartilage can grow from within, can grow interstitially. So what happens during childhood is you've got this band of cartilage, it grows from within, it gets wider, but the bone catches up to it, all right? It kills the cartilage and advances, but then the cartilage grows and pushes away and then the bone catches up and the cartilage pushes away and the bone catches up. And if it sounds like we're getting nowhere, well, we're not changing the situation, but you are getting taller because over this process, you are adding more and more bone to the structure. And so this is what happens as you grow as a child into your uh, teen years. So here you can see an epiphyseal plate. It is made of cartilage, all right? Um, and here you can see lots and lots of rows of cells because they just divide and push away, divide and push away. They are growing interstitially. But here you can see the bone is catching up. So there's bone uh, in the diaphysis, there's bone in the epiphysis. And the bone calcifies the cartilage, the cartilage dies and then the bone advances. Um, but then the uh, the cartilage uh, then grows from within and pushes away. And so as you're a growing child or a growing young adult, this is what happens. Uh, the, the bone advances on the cartilage, but the cartilage uh, uh, divides and pushes away. The bone catches up, the cartilage pushes away, the bone catches up, the cartilage pushes away. And this continues until puberty. When hormones released at puberty tell the bone to start growing faster. When the bone starts growing faster, this epiphyseal plate starts getting narrower and narrower, all right, because uh, this bone is catching up, catching up. The, the uh, cartilage is uh, calcifying uh, until uh, we get to the point where um, uh, the cartilage finally dies. And instead, of, and instead of an epiphyseal plate of cartilage between these two bone fronts, now you just have an epiphyseal line and these two areas uh, uh, fuse. So now what was, say, in your humerus, your arm bone, uh, you know, uh, bone in the diaphysis, then two epiphyseal plates of cartilage, then bone in the epiphysis, now is just one solid arm bone. You still do have cartilage at the very ends where the joints are, because like at my shoulder, I do not want bone rubbing on bone. That's bad for a bunch of reasons. It would chip, it would crack, it would nick blood vessels. Um, I want smooth cartilage to you know, move against smooth cartilage on the shoulder socket. Uh, and so uh, the cartilage isn't completely replaced. The ends of the, the bones where the joints are, this stays uh, cartilage. Um, but other than that, uh, uh, the cartilage is replaced. So big picture, when you think of the vertebrate skeleton, um, there is bone, but it was formed in two different ways. The skull and the clavicle was made through intermembranous ossification. There was no cartilage model, but the vertebrae, the girdles, the shoulder girdle, the hip girdle, and the limbs, whether they be fins or 
um, arms and legs were made through endochondral ossification, where the structure started off with a cartilage model, which was grad, which was then gradually uh, converted to um, uh, bone. Uh, just two final things. I mentioned cartilage. I mentioned uh, bone, and I would like to discuss teeth when it comes to the skull. But just I'd like to quickly mention that um, teeth then have two more tissues, enamel and dentin, and then even the cementum, which anchors the teeth. And this, these are skeletal tissues in addition to bone and cartilage. So the hard skeletal tissues of your body, you know, cartilage, the first one, bone, um, but then you also have enamel, dentin, and cementum as well. Uh, the first fish did not have teeth. All right, so even lampreys today, they lack uh, teeth. The first jawed fish, placoderms, did not have uh, teeth. As I will discuss uh, you know, in, in other units, where did enamel and dentin come from? Well, interestingly, that's what a shark's scales are made of. Shark scales are an odd type. They're called placoid scales. And there's actually enamel and dentin in them. Even some of the bony fish, if you look at their uh, scales as we will, they're, they're white. You've got these big white scales, hard, hard white scales. Why are they hard and white? Because they're made of the same enamel and dentin that teeth are made of. So teeth probably originated by scales in the mouth area, um, then uh, which had enamel and dentin just becoming uh, bigger for uh, prey uh, capture. So the first vertebrates did not have enamel, dentin, and cementum. Um, uh, but as scales adopted these uh, skeletal tissues, uh, scales in the vicinity of, um, uh, of the mouth uh, then uh, became larger and then became teeth. So the first vertebrates did not have teeth. The first jawed vertebrates did not have teeth, um, but then later jawed vertebrates uh, did. So here you can see that there are other tissues, enamel and dentin, in our skeletal system uh, in addition uh, to uh, bone and cartilage. So that was a quick introduction into the skeletal tissues of vertebrates.